So uh, I'll uh, introduce the next speaker, which is myself. <laughs> so moderating myself could be a challenge. Uh, is the sound okay? Yeah, good. Um, so uh, my name is Pierre Olav Berve, which uh, usually translates into P.O. Burvi <laughs> or something in English. Um, and um, I'm uh, working in Oslo, Norway, as a pre-hospital doctor um, and also in hospital at the Oslo University Hospital. Um, um, I also have an engagement at the hyperbaric treatment unit and I'm, uh, for the last three years, I'm a PhD candidate. So I'm here to talk about uh, hemodynamics during mechanical CPR. Why? Well, um, first off, we're in the age where targeted CPR is uh, an issue. We get these feedbacks from uh, the FOMED world. We get some publications where multimodal uh, uh, monitoring during CPR has been done of various quality, but we are there. Uh, the reason is that even if we get l uh, the perfect chain of survival, even if we get a 100% layperson CPR, high quality CPR during the treatment, and even if we get people to treatment afterwards, we know that we don't get it right every time. There's something wrong with the patients because the patients are not like. So the algorithms doesn't work and we would like to take the lessons from the animal lab into the treatment that we do. So what are these treatments um, or these lessons from the animal lab? Um, well, it's that physiology matters. So in my study and my main project has been the Lucas 280 study uh, and I won't report on that now. But there's something that we have discovered on the way that worries us. So we would like to tell you about this. So, okay, targeted CPR. We want to find the things that matter. And what matters? Well, the sacrifice of more than 2,000 pigs and dogs has learned us that during CPR, cardiac output matters, of course. It's a no-brainer. Coronary perfusion matters. It's a no-brainer. And cerebral perfusion matters, of course. But uh, if you want to do targeted CPR, if you believe that these are the very most important phenomena that we need to treat, uh, then you have to believe that N-tidal CO2 is a good surrogate marker for uh, cardiac output. That's what you have. That's what you're left with. You also need to believe that the diastolic pressures are measurable and that they are good surrogate markers for coronary perfusion. That's what you have. That's what's available to you. And you have to believe that cerebral oximetry is a decent marker for cere cerebral perfusion. That's what you're left with for now. All right, I'm a believer in this. I hope maybe some of you as well. Uh, <clears throat> but we are not alone. So in 2012, uh, this uh, paper was published in circulation, endorsed by, uh, by the American Heart Association, and it's a consensus statement from an expert panel. And if you read the names, you'll see what uh, these are the two experts. And they did a different approach. They said, uh, it's not like we should put in, uh, start now putting in uh, all kinds of devices in every patient. But sometimes the patient arrest with some monitoring going on. For example, in the ICU or in the ED or something. So uh, they took uh, the, this point of view and they said, if you have a central line, 
and can merge to CVP. And if you have <coughs> a diastolic <coughs> or uh, arterial line, so you can me measure the diastolic pressure. Okay, then you should uh, um, then you should estimate the coronary perfusion pressure, the diastolic pressure minus the central venous pressure, and you should aim to get that over 20 millimeters of mercury. This is a consensus statement from experts. Further on, if you don't have the central venous line, if you only have the arterial line, okay, then they suggest that you should aim for a diastolic pressure of 25. Okay, then I guess these guys and most of us know that during CPR, central venous pressure is probably a bit higher. So, uh, okay, then go up then, 30, 40. But this is kind of, there's a suggestion that you can trend this, that you can do things to get this up and that you can measure it. They also suggest that you should aim for an end tidal CO2 value of at least 20 millimeters of mercury, a millimeter of mercury and uh, that's 2.6 kilopascal. All right, so we have something to go on. We are not alone, and we should try to do it. So, what's the problem? I'll give you a case. 46-year-old guy, cardiac arrest at the office. Layperson CPR, uh, ACLS when the crew, first crew arrives, physician man car from Oslo arrives, and he gets a ROSC. Okay. And this is where we enter the situation. So he has a ROSC, but his pulse is weak, and his end tidal CO2 is low, and the non-invasive blood pressure won't read. Okay, so he's hypotensive, he's hyperperfused, he's in shock. I guess we do agree on this. So Dr. William Otterstar here, we are sitting back there, actually. <laughs> he decides that he wants to read the, uh, the invasive arterial pressure to get the clue here, what to do. Because uh, which dose of adrenaline should you give? Not one milligram again, I guess. Then 10 mics, maybe too little. 50, sometimes way too much. If you take the time, if you have the training, if you have the system, this is a two minute job. So you can appreciate that the airway is handled. Someone is bagging him. The equipment is positioned where we want it to be positioned, as uh, Richard said, during the, um, during the pit crew CPR. And they are making room for themselves to do the job. William knows that he wants the ultrasound machine to do this job. So he's placing it so he can see the screen. And he's wearing sterile gloves. Okay? So, still, this is a bit messy. Still, they are behind the patient's pathophysiology. They are lagging behind. They are trying to get ahead. But they give him some adrenaline, uh, some mics, and then he stabilizes and they can carry him to this situation. This is where you want to be. Still ROSC, still stable. But the SATs are measured. Entile CO2 is measured. Arterial blood pressure are measured. Um, the Lucas is placed on. The airway is handled. And during the Lucas 2 ID trial, we also had the cerebral oximetry going on. This is multi monitoring. William is doing the third check on the patient's heart. And he has also medication pre drawn if things happen. Okay. So now he's ahead. Still. Okay, of course, the patient arrests. So they start the Lucas, and they get a reading on the blood pressure of 70 over 9. Okay, so this patient needs adrenaline, so he gets some. Okay, and with this some adrenaline, blood pressure rises, or actually, systolic blood pressure rises. And here comes the problem, because the diastolic pressure gets lower. It reads zero, it reads 
minus 5. Okay, so you have the expected effect of adrenaline on the systolic pressure, but the unexpected effect of the uh, adrenaline on the diastolic pressure. That's interesting. Simultaneously, the end tidal CO2 is 1.1. 1 .1, 1 .1. Okay, 8 millimeters of mercury. So, what should you do now? Should you stop the car, do things differently? Uh, he checks with the ultrasound. The heart is definitely getting the compressions. Left ventricle is completely hit by the compressions. So what, what's going on here? Let's check this out. I will show you. But we have to do something before. Uh, <coughs> first, we have to check the mechanics. You have to re-go the mechanics of mechanical CPR. So this is a picture of a patient with a spontaneously... Uh, Actually, it's a video of a uh, patient with a spontaneously beating heart. It's an MR video uh, with the left ventricle to the left, the right ventricle to the right. And uh, what I want you to look at is the end systolic situation. You can see that there's an end systolic volume, of course, and that if you look closely, there's a deceleration of flow and, of course, pressure as you approach end systole. Of course, that's why the aortic valve will shut finally. Okay, so this is a very dynamic situation. Blood is sent out as a dynamic thing. But in this video, from a subcostal view of the heart <coughs> during mechanical CPR, you can see that both ventricles, uh, actually, it's, uh, they've turned the probe the other way around. So we have at the left here, the ventricles, and in the middle there, there's the atria. But both ventricles are completely emptied. Okay? That's different from the, from the other one. And if you look closely, you can see the compression pattern here. When compression goes down, it's held down for a short, brief period and then it's pulled up, hold up for a short brief period and then pulled down. So this is 50-50. That's the duty cycle of the Lucas, for example. Okay, compression, decompression duty cycle, 50-50. Okay, these two videos that I show you, would you expect these videos to produce the same kind of pressure waves? Would you expect the pressure to behave the same way with these two videos, in these two situations, I don't. Uh, I don't, of course. But, and here's the problem, we used exactly the same algorithm to identify the points that we need during this. The machine does not know that this is CPR. It reads the same point. So what does it read? <coughs> oh, sorry. So in play here, of course, we have the cardiac pump theory, we have the thoracic pump theory, which is more the autopulse. It will be a bit different. Okay, you know this. And then the Lucas also do some active decompression. That's here. It pulls back actually with the suction cup of uh, 13 newton meters. And in the Lucas 280 trial, we have uh, uh, experimented and used uh, on 220 patients a machine that pulls back more aggressively, okay? So it goes back to above this, the, uh, the initial sternum level. That's not important here. The point is that it's a lot of strategies to get the blo blood around. Different machines use different strategies. The result will be different pulse waves. Okay, so back to the case. Increasing systolic pressures, decreasing diastolic pressures. So, <coughs> what's the problem? Could it be? Is it so that a diastolic pressure is a good surrogate marker for coronary perfusion? Is it possible to trend the diastolic pressure so that to say higher diastolic pressure, better coronary perfusion? If so, then William has a problem. Okay? Because Coronary perfusion will go down as a result of this kind of logic. 
Otherwise, what could happen if the diastolic <coughs> the pressures and the measurements is not good? Well, <coughs> then we have a diastolic problem. So the normal arterial pulse wave looks like, it looks like this. Okay? And if we focus in on it, we can see that the lowest point between two systolic uh, spikes is the one that is read by the machine as the diastolic pressure. The lowest point between two systoles. This is fairly obvious. But you can also see that it occurs in the late diastolic period. Always. Okay? It has to be that way. Okay? Because we, uh, <coughs> it's a dynamic situation. So, uh, this um, has been actually a subject for several years in the animal lab. In 1997, the Oslo group did a pig study uh, on a mechanical compressions. And what they found was that during uh, systole, uh, and during actually compressions, the black curve here is the aortic pressure, uh, pressure measurements. And the gray one is the right atrial pressures. And <coughs> uh, actually, during compression, the pressure waves behave like normal. But during decompression, in this period, we see that we get an early diastolic negative spike. Okay. So how did I handle this? Well, they just uh, had so many data that so they can deduce that the area between the black line, which is the aortic pressure, and the, right, the gray line, which is the right atrial pressure, that is where coronary perfusion probably happens, when the aortic pressure is higher than the right atrial pressure. Okay, so that is what they used. They chose to look away from the lowest point and used the late diastolic values. Okay, so have any will Anyone else done this? There's not that many papers out there that show these waves. But Duchateau et al. did in 2010, I think, <coughs> this study with an autopulse, which is a completely different you know, working pattern and a principle of working. Um, and what they found was exactly the same. Different machine, this time in 40 humans, Auto-hospital cardiac arrest, most of them brought into the ED before they got their arterial lines. And I found exactly the same problem, a diastolic spike. And actually they commented in the, uh, in the paper that this one is completely useless. Completely useless. Because it varies from beat to beat. It is not trendable. So they chose to use the late diastolic values. But that's not the ones that show on your screen. It's the early diastolic spike that will, stand, will, will be on your screen. That's the one William saw, maybe. Or was it? <coughs> well, this is the pressure curve that he had. So this is a Norwegian-style CPR, three minutes period. We start off uh, by giving adrenaline early on. And all these spikes are compressions, singular compressions. Okay, but it's, it's a bit compressed, all of this. So uh, here are the values. You can see that the diastolic pressure reads out around zero, sometimes below zero. And the systolic pressure with adrenaline rises after 40 seconds to 120, from 80 to 120, just as you would expect. Okay? But the diastolic pressure doesn't trend. This is a problem for me. If I want to do targeted CPR, I want the values to go the way you know, I'm taught they will. So you could think that this is a crazy patient, this is a singular patient, and everything, something must be wrong here. But the entire CO2s are completely normal during this period, 
And also you can uh, see that cere cerebral oxygen symmetry during this period, period follows what would be the map. Okay? So everything is normal except the diastolic pressures in this patient. So, uh, let's zoom in. This is an uh, zooming in in exactly the same, exactly the same data. Okay? So you can see that uh, the diastolic pressure heat reads at zero, sometimes below zero. The systolic is around 120. But there's an early diastolic spike, negative spike. On the contrary, there's a late diastolic peak. And the difference between this is the early diastolic spike is zero. The late diastolic peak is 60. So what is, perf what is perfusing his heart? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll try to go uh, to, to do this even a bit more deeper. Okay, so add in the central venous pressure measured both of these. Remember, both of these are measured in the groin. So the upper one here is the uh, blood pressure. The lower one is the impedance signal. So I can use the impedance signal to see if I can synchronize these data. <coughs> so one more of these spikes. So these are central venous pressures. And you can see that this one has spikes. It, it, it looks differently from the arterial pressures, as you would expect. And if we do a layover of this, then you can see that it's synchronized. That's all you can see from this. I will clean it up for you. So it's still a bit messy, but you can see the impedance signal down here. It's completely synchronized. And if we look at the combined arterial and venous pressure, this is the systolic period, okay? And these are the negative spikes. In these periods, I would suggest that coronary perfusion is very little likely to happen, okay? But during the late uh, diastole, it's very likely that it will happen. But this is not the number you get on your machine. Okay? So, what do we do about this? Is it possible to get around it? For now, no. <laughs> At least, for now, you cannot get an algorithm in a pre-hospital or ED machine that will tell you the late diastolic pressures. It won't choose it. There's no, uh, I don't think there's a pattern for it. But you can use what you have, your brain, and your pattern recognition uh, uh, brain, which actually is really good at this. So if you pay attention to it, you can actually see on this one that there's a <coughs> more dense area in the middle. This corresponds with the late diastolic phase. And, uh, I, I guess this is possible to find an algorithm for. And yes, as you would appreciate, if I trend this, if I trend this, I wouldn't be too surprised that the patient got ROSC in the next few minutes, which actually happened. Okay. So, okay, uh, maybe I'm done now. Okay, I've told you that we cannot use the diastolic pressures on your machine. Uh, so, but what about cardiac output then? Let's go through that one as well. Because as I said to you, if you, if you believe in targeted CPR, you have to believe that entitled CO2 is trendable. And uh, that entitled CO2 is a robust marker for cardiac output. Okay. But what if it's not? The patient William had, had a entitled CO2 of 1.1. Everything el else looked normal, but the entire CO2 read as 1.1. What's wrong here? What's going on? Well, maybe we have an entire CO2 identification problem. Maybe. Let's look at the curves then. So, <clears throat> first, first up, the definition. 
the definition of end tidal CO2 is the end expiratory, expiratory partial pressure of CO2 measured at the air opening. Okay, that's a physical thing. That's something that exists right outside the mouth opening or at the end of the tube. That's a partial pressure of CO2. It's molecules. Okay, that's the definition at, at a certain time in the, in the, uh, in the tidal volume. But, <coughs> so, the machine, this is, this is uh, CO2 curves from a patient during Lucas II treatment. Okay, they look perfect. Do you agree? Someone has something to complain about in these curves? Perfect curves. Okay? So what if I say that this one is six seconds long? Ooh. Because what I, if I, if I would, uh, because the machine would identify the end uh, alveolar plateau reading as end tidal. Is it end tidal, really? What about this one? Nine seconds. Does your patient breathe out a volume of 250 to 300 milliliters over nine seconds? I don't think so. Okay, I'll let you chew on this one. Uh, this is a whole other subject. I think this is really important scientific impact. Okay, but for the clinical impact, we need this one for another one. It's because it is the end of the alveola plateau that is recognized. Okay. So, uh, a French, uh, uh, an Italian group sent this letter to uh, the editor in recitation in 2012. And they stated, never trust the numbers, believe at the curves. Why? Well, this is during mechanical CPR, and it's uh, with end tidal capnography. Uh, uh, it's with capnography going on, of course. Capno uh, and um, they had these curves. So the blue line here, the blue fields, is the capno capnographic uh, representation of the CO2 values. Okay, and. You can appreciate that the top volume is there, okay? But, uh, and this one reads out at 30 millimeter mercury. That's four kilopascal. But this happens two seconds into the, uh, uh, into the ventilation or the exhalation. After that, the alveolar plateau has a bumpy ride before it suddenly descends. And it's actually this point that is measured here. If you see down here, that is one that is read out. So the machine reads end tile CO2 of 18, but the doctor's eyeball uh, end tile CO2 of 30 millimeters of mercury. That's a great difference. Okay, so in our trial, we looked at the first 20 patients and we see that half of them have this kind of curve profiles. And uh, just a few patients has this perfect that we looked at uh, earlier on. Okay, two completely sets of data, actually. <coughs> so, to, be, <laughs> to, to knock this in, the top reading is one strategy to find the end tidal CO2, which is used by some monitors. Other monitors find the end tidal, the end alveolar plateau reading. And they do it even if the, it's a descending alveolar plateau, even if it's bumpy, they read when the curve descends to zero, they take the highest measurement within the last second. Okay. So you have two strategies, top reading, end reading. And the difference between this, when the plateau is falling, is 40%. And among those 20 patients we had, actually five of them had end readings at 20 minutes below 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, and of those five, four of them had top readings above 15. So one machine would tell me continue, one machine would 
suggest me to end. This is a problem. Okay. So, <coughs> what about these peak readings? Can you trust them? The top reading of the alveolar plateau. Well, this is, these are ventilations with very different uh, uh, duration. But you see here that they read out at 5.3 kilopascal, all of them. Very stable. If I try to trend the late diastolic, or the, sorry, the end alveolar plateau reading, then I get this. No trend. So is the top or the peak reading trendable? Yes, I think so. And again, is the end reading trendable? I don't think so. Okay. So I leave you with this. If you believe in targeted CPR like me, you need to use the best monitor there is your pattern recognition capable brain. This has consequences for you. You really need to see the screen, always. That's how you need to organize your workspace. And you really need to pay attention to this. And what do you look for? Well, you look for the late diastolic blood pressures, if they're there. And you look for for now, you look for the peak alveolar plateau readings. Okay, that's my message. So I'll leave you with the words of the, our, our Italian friends. Never trust the numbers, believe at the curves. Okay. <laughs>